they've conducted experiments where they put people under hypnosis. And tell them that when they get out of, out of hypnosis, at a certain signal, they'll do something. And then sure enough, they come out of hypnosis, at the signal, they do it. They climb a ladder, wave their hand, or whatever. And then they're asked, why did you do that? And the people will give explanations. I wanted to do X. I wanted to do Y. And the people running the experiments have said this is proof that people have no free will, that our idea of free will is an illusion, because the decision was made much earlier and much under, under much different circumstances than the people claimed. Well, it doesn't necessarily prove that. It also, it just might be the case that we're very ignorant of our own intentions. When you allowed yourself to be put under hypnosis, that was an intention. And part of your mind, under hypnosis, agreed to follow the orders. It may have been in a position where it wouldn't agree. There are people, you know, who are very hard to hypnotize. And from the standpoint of the Buddhist teachings, that's the interpretation that's worth following. It's worth pursuing. That we do have free will, and yet we're very ignorant of our intentions. And a large part of the purpose of the practice is to learn how to understand what it means to have an intention, to make a choice. Because it's in those little moments of freedom that the past, the end of suffering, lies. And so the best way to learn about intentions is to try to set up some constant intentions and see what happens to them. Like right now, make up your mind you're going to stay with the breath. See how long you can do it. And you may find that you're suddenly off someplace else, and you don't know why. We go back to the breath again. You do this over and over, and after all, you begin to realize you've got to expect that there will be a disturbance, there will be a distraction. The mind will change its mind. A new intention will come in and take over. And what you've got to learn to do is learn how to observe that process. To begin seeing the, the little signals that the mind has changed its mind, and yet it's still pretending to be staying with the breath, but it's ready to go. The, most, the briefest lapse of mindfulness, and it's gone. And you wonder, how could that happen in such a brief moment? Well, it wasn't just that one brief moment. The decision had already been made, but it was buried. So now you're warned. You want to start detecting that decision, uncovering all the layers of ignorance and delusion that cover it up. And you begin to realize that you run into other intentions that like to keep it covered up. So there's going to be a battle inside. One mind, but there are lots of minds to it. Lots of opinions, lots of intentions. But the only way you're going to undercover, undercover these things is you try to stick with that one intention as much as possible. This begins with the intention to put an end to suffering. And that's based on the conviction that it is possible to do it. Conviction, they say, starts with conviction and in the Buddha's awakening, that he did find the end of suffering, and he did it through developing powers of his mind. And they weren't powers that were peculiar to him. They were powers that anybody could develop. 
this is an important form of conviction because it gives you impetus to get on the path. It's okay. He could do it. So can I. And then you need to maintain that conviction. And so the knowledge you start out with is not really knowledge, it's a conviction. It's, it's an untested hypothesis that you're going to test, but you think it's worth testing, as with any scientist. There are lots of different hypotheses that a scientist could test, lots of different theories you could test. But the scientist has to choose, okay, which ones are you going to test? Which ones are going to be worthwhile? Which ones will teach you something if you test them? So we were testing the hypothesis that the idea that suffering can be put to an end is worth testing. That gives you the impetus. It also gives you a rudimentary experience of what's called appropriate attention, focusing on the question of suffering as being of paramount importance. Because we could focus on lots of other issues in life, the economy, the weather, the environment. This person's ideas, that person's preferences. Lots of different things we could choose to focus on as being important. But appropriate attention starts with the idea that suffering is an important problem and there is a solution to it. So it's not really knowledge yet, it's a conviction. But it's focusing you on a particular problem. You've chosen this one as the one that's really worth exploring, really worth trying to solve. And so that's why we meditate, because part of the solution lies in developing certain qualities of mind, like mindfulness, alertness, concentration. It's when mindfulness lapses, you don't have to debate whether it's worth wandering off after that distraction. Your conviction tells you, no, it's best to get back, back to the breath. And it's based on that conviction that you develop what's called right effort. You start generating the desire to want to do this. People often think that the Buddha gave desire bad press, but he gives it an important role. It's right there and right after you generate desire to give rise to skillful qualities, generate desire to abandon unskillful ones. In other words, the best way to do this is to get yourself to want to do it. So it's not just a mechanical process of following somebody's orders. You have to find ways of encouraging yourself on the path. That's how you develop your wisdom, how you develop your discernment realizing that this really is a worthwhile prospect, worthwhile project to, to pursue. So even though you're just focusing on the breath, and lots of people say, well, what are you learning when you focus on the breath? You realize that this is an important exercise. It exercises your mindfulness, your concentration, your discernment, all the qualities you're going to need to solve this problem of suffering. And to test the Buddha's claim that by solving the problem of suffering, you actually arrive at, at the deathless, something that does not change, that lies outside of space and time. It's quite a claim. But you can think about what life would be like if there were no happiness that lies outside of space and time. You gain something, you're going to lose it someday. You gain it again, you lose it again. What real satisfaction is there in that? Here's someone who seems reasonable and claims that it is possible to find a happiness that doesn't have to depend on conditions. And it's up to you to decide, do you want to follow that possibility? Do you want to explore that possibility? So you sit down, you focus on your breath to develop the qualities of mind that are needed to, to test that claim.
So that's the beginning of appropriate attention. It's based on a choice that you make, and a choice that you have to keep on making, because it's so easy to fall off the path. It can be a long path, and it requires a lot of discipline. It requires persistence, patience, qualities that we in the modern world tend to have in only small quantities. And so it's very easy to give up. So you keep on generating that desire. Keep on reminding yourself, why are you here? There at least you're here to learn about the potentials in the mind. How far can these potentials go? So our attitude is that we're testing a hypothesis, but we believe that it's an important hypothesis to test. It's an interesting combination of skepticism and conviction. But it's through that kind of questioning, choosing a question you think is important, and examining it again and again. That's how knowledge is attained. In particular, as you develop these qualities, you begin to understand more and more what it is to make a choice. Where exactly do you make those choices? And begin to realize there are many, many layers of choice that go on in the mind. A lot of our explanations as to why we did something are pretty wide at the mark. They're narratives that we create after the fact, without really observing these things as they actually happen. This is why the Buddha places so much emphasis on alertness, noticing what's going on. It talks about observing craving, the, the cause of suffering. You have to see it right there where it's happening to see exactly what the choice is and where it was made, why it was made. And you can do that only if you stay very close to the present moment. This is why the breath is such an ideal topic for meditation. It's right here in the present moment. It's right where the mind and the body meet. When you're here, you're much more likely to see your intentions as they're as they're being made, the choices as they're being made. It requires a lot of sensitivity. This is why it requires time, because you have to keep coming back, coming back, coming back, looking deeper and deeper. It requires stronger and stronger powers of concentration, mindfulness, alertness, getting the mind really still so that it can detect even the slightest movements. So even though the going may seem slow, don't let that be a deterrent. It's going to be a gradual process for everyone. And it seems to be taking a long time and a lot of effort. Remind yourself, the Buddha himself took a long time, had to put in a lot of effort. But when he came out the other end, he said this was more than worth the effort. And so you think about that possibility, that through understanding your intentions, you can find something that lies beyond intention. That's the route to freedom. So keep looking at the choices you make. Exactly when do you make them? How do you make them? Where do you make them? Try to get as precise as possible. It's right around that area of intention that there lies the opening to freedom. Because after all, what is a choice? There is a little moment of freedom right there where you can choose X or Y. And generally our choices are very, very conditioned by past ideas, past beliefs, 
past habits. And because we're not paying full attention to it, we just go along with our old ways of doing things. So don't we really don't really appreciate exactly where that choice is and how it's made. So an important part of mindfulness is to decondition yourself. The Buddha said, just look at the breath, look at the body in and of itself, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. In other words, your old habits of thinking about the world out there, putting aside your old ways of you know, using your eyes and ears and nose, tongue, body and mind to focus on issues outside there in the world, get you knowledge about the world, figure out how to gain what you want out of the world, and then of course get upset when you don't get what you want and try to find new ways of getting it. Now we want to use our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind for other purposes, just to see what they are in and of themselves. Look at them in such a way that shows the movements of the mind, how the mind makes a choice, and how it enforces that choice, how it justifies that choice to itself. All these processes are going on, but we don't look at them because our attention is focused someplace else, far away. So again, you want to stay right here at the breath, because this is a great place to observe all of these other things. The Buddha makes a comparison to six kinds of animals, so you tie them all to a common spot on the leash. And then the animals would all pull in their various directions. The crocodile would want to go down into the river, the monkey would want to go climb up into a tree, the hyena would want to go to a charnel ground. And then depending on which animal is the strongest, the other ones would get dragged along. But he says, if you tie them all to a post, then no matter how hard they pull, they all end up staying right there at the post. The post here is mindfulness of the body. And the prime way of practicing mindfulness of the body is to be mindful of the breath. When you stay with the breath, you can sense the pull that goes out the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, or the mind, the past and future. But you don't have to give in, because you've got a place where you can stay grounded. And that way you can observe the processes that happen at the eye and the ear, how our perception arises, how the perception turns into a, into a thought, and how the thought begins to develop fangs to make you suffer. These things are all here to be observed. They're all happening all the time. But we have to change our focus, and to change our focus means requires a change of heart. And this really is important, much more important than those things outside. That's what conviction is all about. Appropriate attention is the change of focus. Conviction is the change of heart. When you make up your mind that this is an important issue that's got to be resolved, and this is the way to do it, training the mind, developing these qualities so you can see what's going on in the present more and more clearly, and you uncover all those layers of delusion that cover up your intentions, those little spots where there's a potential for freedom which we don't usually make the most of. So that's what we're looking for. And try to keep that as, as your utmost priority. Because it's in having that sense of priority that you actually test what the Buddha taught and see if the way out really exists. <laughs>